evening and a warm welcome to everybody behind the screens. My name is Sven Sappelt and I will moderate this event on big data and urbanism tonight. On the occasion of the unfinished metropolis, we will talk about a topic that is still at the very beginning. We will talk about the impact of digitalization on urban development and city planning. We thought it would be a good idea to bring together experts from different areas and countries to discuss this topic. And we are quite honored to welcome tonight Lenora da Silva Schweizer from Brazil, Dietmar Offenhuber from the United States, and also Ralf Martin Sohe from Estonia. And we welcome also Michael Harms from the German Academic Exchange Service, who will join the evening. But before I will go further into details, I would like to pass the word to Ute Weiland, the CEO of Germany on uh, Land of Ideas and also the initiator of this event tonight. Good evening. A very warm welcome on behalf of Deutschland Land der Ideen to this evening on the topic the coded city urbanism on, in the age of big data. We at Land of Ideas not only promote German ideas, but we are embracing an exchange of ideas to find better solutions, and this time for our cities. Over the past decades, digital technologies have made their way into our cities. Smart grid technology and the Internet of Things, shared urban mobility, online retail and e-governance are already part of our urban experiences. As the Italian architect Carlo Ratti once put it, our cities are becoming computers in the air. They become smart cities, places where traditional networks and services are made more efficient with the use of digital and communication technologies. And when we talk about smart cities, we sometimes only hear those buzzwords like big data, artificial intelligence, digital digital technologies, and so on. But the city is something else. It's a place for people. We do not make cities to create a modern infrastructure or to advance digital technologies. We make cities to come together, to communicate together, to work together, and to enjoy culture. We are social be beings, and we want to live in a city that we can be with other people. So the city of the future has to be smart for the benefit of its inhabitants. It must go beyond the use of communication technologies for better resource use or less emissions. It means smarter urban transport networks, upgraded water supply, and waste disposal facilities, more efficient ways to light and heat buildings, it also means an interactive and responsive city administration, safer public spaces, and meeting the needs of children and an aging population. Big data should become an enabler and not a driver for livable and sustainable cities. The smart city is a holistic concept and it should answer the question, how can we make our cities sustainable, inclusive, healthy, enriching, and safe for everyone? This evening, we are going to take a peek into the future. How will big data shape our cities and our everyday life? At the same time, we want to talk about innovative ideas from all around the world that are already taking shape right now. I'm very delighted that we have three experts tonight who will talk about these questions from different angles and perspectives. Therefore, I'd like to thank the Architekten and Ingenieurverband Berlin-Brandenburg, our host for this evening and the organizer of the program Unfinished Metropolis. A big thanks to the Embassy of Estonia, which connected us to our speaker, Ralf Martin Sua from Tallinn. Sven Sappelt is not only our moderator tonight, we also 
he also invited our speaker, Professor Dietmar Offenhuber, and we created the program together. Thank you very much, Sven. This event tonight would not be possible without the support of the German Centers of Research and Innovation. They connected us to our speaker from Brazil, Professor Lenora de Boripea da Silva Schweitzer. And I'm very happy about our cooperation and I hope many more will follow. I would now pass over to Dr. Michael Harms. He is the Director of Communications at the DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service at the Federal Foreign Office. Dr. Harms, thank you very much for your contribution and support. And now the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ute Weidand. Um, the honor is all mine. I'm delighted to be a part of this event tonight. Um, you said it already. My name is Michael Harms. I am Director of Communications at the DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service. We are, in fact, in charge of the management of the network of German Centers for Research and Innovation, or DWEH, as we say in German. The DWEH are a joint initiative of German science organizations, universities, um, the research intensive industry, and are funded by the German Federal Foreign Office. At five locations worldwide in Sao Paulo, New York, Tokyo, New Delhi, and Moscow, the German centers enable German innovators to present themselves jointly, provide a showcase for the high quality of German research, and network with local cooperation partners. As such, the German centers for research and innovation are one-stop shops. They strengthen knowledge about the German science, research, and innovation landscape advise scientists and academics in Germany and in the countries in which they are based. Cities and climate is the highlight topic of our network in 2020. It is our aim to boost research in the sustainable future of, of cities and promote an exchange with innovation drivers worldwide. And this is exactly why we're so happy to be in this event tonight with the Architekten and Ingenieurvereins of Berlin-Brandenburg and Land of Ideas which have been a partner for the German Centers for Research and Innovation for many, many years. Now, you know all the figures much better than I do. More than half of the world's population live in urban cities today, in urban areas today. And according to the United Nations, uh, this figure will rise to two thirds by 2050. Today, cities consume over two thirds of the world's energy requirements and are responsible for over 70% of CO2 emissions. At the same time, as centers of education, research and entrepreneurship, cities are also crystallization points for innovation. And using the potential of digitization and the wealth of data that we have uh, for ecological urban development and sustainability is a truly fascinating challenge. I'm excited to learn about this potential tonight and I'm looking forward very much to our talk between renowned international experts and uh, would like to say thank you very much again to both uh, the partners of this um, event tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much, Ute. As already mentioned, we would like to discuss the topic of today, urban-driven city development, um, from three different perspectives. And at the beginning, we will get some insights from Ralph Martin Sohe on the very first platform for transnational smart city solutions. Based in Estonia and Finland, his cross-border project creates a new center of excellence for research innovation in the domains of data, governance, mobility, energy, and built environment. Second, we will have a look on the current discussion on big data and the role of citizens in the governance of smart cities, and on the question how the principal idea of smart cities may become different if we consider the demand of civic participation in using, shaping, and governing the data of their cities. And I'm very happy to have Dietmar Offenhuber as a real expert on this topic with us tonight. Third, we will reflect the legal dimensions of data and city development in between the tension of open access on the one and cybersecurity on the other side. And I'm really looking forward to listen to the profound experience of Lenora Schweitzer in that particular field. Now I pass the word to Ralf Martin Sowell, 
as the father and founding director of Finest Twins at Tallinn University of, ne te of Technology in Estonia. Um, so, uh, uh, good, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you so much, uh, first of all, uh, for inviting me um, for this uh, small uh, presentation and talk. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy uh, uh, to participate uh, and, uh, and share some ideas uh, with you. Um, so um, I will uh, start uh, from uh, from a very brief uh, introduction, but uh, but uh, but, uh, but later we will go to the domain as well. But uh, but what is the need? Why we need to talk about smart cities and and what are smart cities in general? And uh, and uh, and I started working with a field uh, of smart cities uh, already uh, uh, six, seven years ago. And back then, to be honest, uh, I had uh, quite uh, clear uh, picture uh, what uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, domain actually means. Uh, at least I, I managed to define it for myself. And, uh, and, and I was quite happy that I, I, I discovered this, uh, this field uh, uh, that I actually dedicated quite a lot of time and did my dissertation as well. And uh, back then, uh, uh, smart cities was meant uh, uh, in a very narrow sense as digital cities. So meaning that, uh, that, uh, that uh, it was mainly seen as, uh, as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a key and, and approach uh, uh, how to move from analog uh, to digital and, uh, and, and how to help uh, cities offering uh, digital services. And for this, uh, obviously, Estonia is, is, is one of the uh, uh, most uh, uh, successful uh, places, uh, um, and uh, yeah, I, I just try to uh, uh, share my slides in a bit better approach. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, no, but it's also fine. We can see it very good, so. Yes. I also, think interesting I pattern. <laughs> um, okay, I didn't see this coming. Uh, sorry, but uh, but uh, uh, as said, um, Estonians, uh, where I'm from, uh, are very bad in small talk, uh, and uh, and all kind of technical issues was meant. Uh, um, uh, or was were in, 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 invented by Estonians uh, to, to go over and uh, this, 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 uh, this introductory and small door part, and uh, and and this is uh, like every time when when we had some issues with Skype, uh, we were saying that uh, that uh, Skype actually intended this kind of small challenges uh, in in kicking off uh, presentations, but uh, but uh, as said. Um, uh, um, smart cities is a very broad domain, and 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 when we started with that, um, uh, it was very easily understood as as, as digital cities, meaning that uh, that back when we had analog telephones, uh, and smartphones were like a new uh, idea concept, and uh, and uh, and also we had analog uh, watches, and smart watches were then like a new concept. Uh, uh, but uh, but now what has happened is that, uh, that uh, in most cases uh, uh, cities actually are very digital. Uh, so uh, so we don't need to talk about uh, smart cities anymore from a digitalization perspective. But uh, but uh, but the domain also involves uh, uh, participatory elements and it also involves. Uh, 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 everything related to uh, climate change and energy. So it has really involved and uh, and, and developed uh, um, as a, as a concept as well. And and that being said is that uh, that every time uh, uh, I'm at attending various smart city events, uh, um, when uh, five ten years ago it was quite straightforward uh, what was understood uh, by that. Uh, and uh, and uh, and when I went to the Brussels uh, first time to attend uh, European Commission events, uh, when uh, when I was the one to 
to give some kind of enlightenment talks, uh, what is meant by smart city. And now when I go back to and attend some events uh, coming from Brussels side or like wherever, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that I don't know anymore what is meant by smart city. And, uh, and to some extent, we can even turn this around and say that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that maybe uh, same as happened as with smartphone as well, but, uh, but, but, uh, but we don't need to talk about smartphones anymore. Smartphones are already default standard and smartwatches are becoming default as well. And, and so we can say that we can come back to the key point of, of talking about uh, cities in general. Uh, but indeed, um, uh, uh, we have initiated a, a totally new uh, uh, smart city center of excellence, uh, which is based in Tallinn, and uh, and uh, and we have received uh, competitive uh, European grant uh, to set it up, uh, 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 which is one of the biggest uh, European grants that Estonia has ever received, uh, so approximately 30, 30 million euros, uh, and uh, and so. Our goal is uh, to grow into a global uh, um, city uh, development center. And, uh, and what is also important is that, uh, that uh, we internally have uh, 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 defined a smart city uh, uh, via five uh, research streams. So that means that uh, that. Uh, that our researchers uh, work in a field of built environment, energy, mobility, data and governance. And uh, we are not a one country initiative as uh, Estonia is, uh, is, uh, is a very small country. Uh, we can even say that it's a micro country uh, by population 1.3 million. Then we have teamed up um, uh, with uh, partners uh, from uh, Finland, uh, Aalto University and, uh, and, and City of Helsinki uh, to build this center of excellence uh, jointly. So a lot of uh, uh, research excellence is actually coming from Aalto University side uh, and, uh, and our core uh, concept uh, for innovation pilots uh, is coming from uh, uh, Forum Virum Helsinki, which is a city-owned uh, Helsinki city-owned company, uh, and um, uh, another very important uh, aspect there is that uh, that uh, um, uh, our working definition of smart city is that uh, that uh, that cities are smart if they are open to new technologies. And this can mean that, uh, that cities themselves invest into new technologies and promote uh, taking, uptaking of new technologies. But, uh, but this can also be that the environment itself is, is more open to experimenting with, uh, with novel technologies. And, uh, and, uh, and you also um, initiate and, and have more hands-on approach with that. Uh, we have decided that, uh, that, uh, that we will invest uh, at least half of our initial grant budget uh, into uh, city challenges based uh, pilots and uh, and here uh, uh, we don't need to talk about any more about smart city as, as such as such but uh, but we define when our pilots as as as, uh, as, as that they need to be um, uh, actual city challenges based um, uh, but uh, we have defined city challenges more broadly, but, uh, but we are looking into the challenges uh, that are mutual, at least to several cities, uh, uh, and that also are more uh, looking into the future, meaning that if there is a hole in, in, in some uh, street uh, or, or, or in some building or some issue uh, uh, in one city, then uh, this is not something that, uh, that we as researchers should tackle. Uh, but, uh, but if there are joint challenges uh, uh, shared with, uh, with local governments, uh, uh, then this is something when uh, their research can, can, uh, can be help of as well. And, and this is why we very recently kicked off uh, our uh, uh, pilot program uh, where uh, we will initiate uh, at least 10 large scale pilots uh, uh, with a total uh, budget of 15 million euros. Uh, uh, so, and we are in a, in a very close of announcing uh, first pilots. Um, uh, but uh, but uh, why I'm introducing this is that, 
what uh, what uh, what uh, by designing and 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 really like making this hard decision that uh, that we are taking uh, our core lab activities out uh, from university and we are going to the city level and uh, and we are actually trying to face uh, the challenges that cities are are actually having and uh, and we even didn't have any any financial push from our uh, financiers but we really thought that uh, that this needs to be our strategy that uh, that uh, that, uh, that we are not focusing on the ideas only exclusively coming from researchers, but we are actually focusing on ideas coming from cities. And, uh, and, and we had a very systematic approach uh, where we involved uh, 35 local governments uh, and mapped uh, uh, future challenges uh, in, in, in the five fields we are operating. And then... Uh, uh, and and uh, and and uh, and as said, we were not interested uh, in, in in single challenges of, of one city, but we were interested in in, in, in challenges what are shared uh, with cities. And uh, and then uh, we had a consensus meeting and several workshops where we actually came up uh, with a ranking uh, of the top ten uh, challenges, uh, but uh, at least uh, cities in this region are facing. Um, so we were. Uh, uh, to, to, to give some very uh, brief example is that, uh, that one challenge uh, was that, uh, that um, uh, local government-owned buildings uh, could be more energy efficient. And, uh, and, uh, and, and then uh, like another challenge was that, uh, that uh, uh, public services um, uh, uh, should be more accessible uh, uh, to the citizens. Uh, so, uh, so, and all the like other eight ones as as well. Um, uh, when we mapped them and opened up a, a international idea competition, um, there we received uh, 71 uh, uh, very competitive and good ideas. Uh, um, uh, uh, all of them involving at least two cities. Uh, and, and now we are like have shortlisted this uh, to 10 to 12 ideas and, and we are kicking off first pilots uh, from January uh, uh, next year. And through this process, uh, we have also um, had some discussions with other similar programs like this, uh, um, starting with you and habitants uh, approach uh, to innovation challenges and, uh, and Nesta's approach and, and also Forum Virum Helsinki is one and have looked uh, into another as well and, and we have seen that, uh, that this kind of uh, 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 city-based challenges uh, and, and, uh, and, and research uh, pilots is something uh, quite unique uh, and, uh, and in a way uh, uh, we are experimenting ourselves uh, with a new concept, uh, and, uh, and 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 hopefully, if we succeed, uh, you will hear more uh, from this piloting program as well. Later, I will sh show a website uh, where you can see uh, at least which are the challenges and what is our core approach. Uh, but uh, but as I've been working in a field um, uh, already uh, uh, six seven years. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and then I will just give uh, some overviews of uh, ongoing uh, pilots, what we have initiated here in Tallinn as well. Um, now there are several pilots uh, related to uh, robot vehicles. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and we have been continuously now piloting uh, several uh, uh, robot vehicles uh, in the open streets in Tallinn, uh, ranging from... Uh, from uh, 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 pizza delivery, small uh, vehicles uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, public service related uh, robot uh, shuttle buses, uh, which can be seen here on, on this slide as well. And, uh, and, uh, and what we have learned uh, very surprisingly is that, uh, that, uh, that um, the openness uh, from public um, uh, and the uh, interest uh, from the general public uh, to actually use this kind of uh, robot delivery or, or like self-driven uh, vehicle-based services is very high, and the trust towards uh, these kind of pilots is also very high. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, technical and operational capability is very low. And, uh, and, and so we have had several issues uh, with, uh, with initiating and running those pilots, uh, uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, uh, people at least in our pilots, have been very supportive and have given very positive feedback. Uh, 
Ben, as said uh, in the introduction, uh, that, uh, that we are interested in the, uh, in the cross-border areas, uh, and we are interested in, in the um, in, the, in offering digital tools um, uh, for uh, several cities at the same time, uh, and, and here one uh, project what uh, what we started with was uh, was Finnish Smart Mobility, which was coordinated and led by the city of Helsinki and involved uh, three cities, including also city of Tallinn and city of Vanta, and over there. Uh, we invested uh, into actual pilots uh, between those uh, three uh, cities uh, uh, to help uh, uh, analyzing and, uh, and, and planning uh, cross-border traffic. And here is, is one example from, uh, from the port area uh, of Helsinki that, uh, that we developed this dashboard uh, of, uh, of, uh, of mobility uh, involving open data, Twitter alerts, uh, route suggestions, and so on. That was one comprehensive uh, system. And also, uh, we had a plan how to, how to, how to integrate with, uh, with, uh, with Tallinn, uh, also the port side. Uh, another example is that we actually traced uh, uh, all the ferries operating between uh, uh, two uh, capital cities of Tallinn and Helsinki, uh, and, uh, and, and according to the city of Helsinki, uh, the passenger traffic, at least be be before the um, uh, uh, pandemia time, uh, uh, was the most intensive uh, globally. Uh, so we have more than uh, 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 approximately 10 million commutes annually uh, between those small uh, cities. And so a lot of uh, ferry traffic is, uh, is, 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 is happening. And, and so we traced and we actually opened up uh, in real time uh, ferry traffic uh, between two cities. And then different other services followed. Uh, and, uh, and another uh, uh, pilot uh, that we initiated as well uh, was... Uh, when uh, uh, um, uh, application or service for heavy good vehicle drivers uh, to queue up in the port areas. And this is something which is shared in most of the cities, uh, in most of harbor cities, that the uh, parking facilities are being uh, uh, built into uh, offices and residential areas and, uh, and, and those heavy good vehicles uh, but still need to go through the central-based uh, harbors. Uh, they cannot be uh, uh, any more parked uh, in the central site, uh, but we actually developed uh, a pilot uh, that, uh, that they will queue up virtually outside from the city center uh, and, and then uh, they enter the port area as scheduled. Uh, 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 another uh, pilot um, uh, um, is related to uh, uh, renovating uh, buildings uh, similar to Berlin, um, uh, 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 Tallinn, and, and another Soviet bloc uh, cities have this uh, uh, heritage of those uh, non-renovated uh, uh, and, uh, and very uh, poorly isolated uh, uh, Rutsovka buildings, and, and so there's a one um, uh, pilot uh, project in the city of Tartu, where uh, like uh, 20 or 30 of them are being uh, renovated into smart Tovkas, so making them uh, smart. Uh, and, and, uh, and this is uh, already in the concluding, concluding stage, but we have seen that, uh, that, uh, that this is very promising work, uh, that, uh, that uh, at least in the cities where you cannot uh, uh, rebuild uh, uh, the apartment houses, but uh, or like you cannot uh, deconstruct them, uh, but uh, but you actually need to significantly rebuild them. And then uh, my last slide. Uh, uh, sorry for the um, uh, for the pumpy start. Uh, um, it never works in in the trial, but uh, but it worked uh, here in real time. Uh, but uh, but the very last slide uh, is something where. Uh, Estonian local governments uh, uh, are very uh, experimental and uh, and globally uh, as innovative as possible at le at, at least in terms of uh, of free flow of data. Uh, so um, uh, due to the, uh, the governmental uh, 
IT architecture, uh, all local government databases are inter interlinked with each other. And that means that, uh, that, uh, that if you are a, a citizen and you need to uh, pull data from, uh, from several local governments at the same time, for example, if you re-register from one city to another city as, as, as a resident, uh, then this is one service uh, because uh, the databases are, are, are shared. But if you also uh, visit one public uh, hospital in one city, and when you visit another public, of, uh, public uh, hospital in another city, uh, then this data is being automatically uh, made available as well. So this is very experimental, uh, but, uh, but it has been proven uh, uh, very successful as well. I don't want to go too much in, in depth with that, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but at least uh, uh, as a last sentence, I would say that uh, that from Estonia's side, um, we have applied uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, like open internet uh, for local governments, meaning that uh, meaning that uh, that uh, that uh, if one city uh, servant or one citizen from one city can access a website of of other city, then we have this system. But uh, that, uh, that the most private data can be exchanged exactly the same way over the internet. And uh, no other uh, country has, uh, has, uh, has uh, opened up uh, and, and conducted this kind of uh, fully uh, integrated approach uh, before. So uh, uh, thank you from my side. Uh, uh, I would also ask you to check uh, our website on the city challenges. Uh, um, uh, just to check out uh, uh, what uh, are the current uh, urban challenges coming from uh, our side uh, and also like uh, already in a month from now we will announce uh, which pilots uh, we are kicking off as well. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for listening uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it has been very uh, interesting for me to attend uh, this, uh, this session. Thank you very much, Ralf Martin. Um, we have later the possibility to go more into detail, but maybe two questions um, for the very first beginning. The first would be, I have the impression that the government plays a very strong role in this process. And could you explain a little bit how the collaboration between policy or government and um, universities, research and companies work? Um, um this is uh, uh, very different uh, uh, compared to uh, big countries. Uh, institutionally, uh, there are similar borders, uh, but uh, informally, uh, uh, um, uh, it, it is uh, working more as one platform or one ecosystem. Because if you have a population of uh, one million people altogether, and, and you have a split bet between uh, local government, government companies, uh, politicians, and so on, uh, then uh, uh, informal connections are so much stronger, uh, meaning that, uh, that, uh, that the government, uh, uh, both central government and local government, uh, is held more accountable from a citizen's perspective. And, uh, and, uh, and that means that uh, that uh, if government, for example, is uh, introducing a new service uh, uh, to citizens, uh, then um, uh, uh, most active citizens uh, actually have direct link, link to some of the government members through um, uh, their connections, uh, meaning that, uh, that, uh, that uh, it is more like, uh, like uh, like Estonia can be seen as like uh, like a test country for new ideas, uh, and uh, and uh, and, uh, and and here the like the informal uh, uh, barriers between companies, uh, uh, government, and local government and academia are not that strong. And uh, I myself are also one example, but uh, but uh, most people uh, also like tend to rotate more between those uh, areas. So I have been working for the government, I have been working for the industry, and now I'm working for the ac academia. And, uh, and this is very common here. Uh, 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 but, uh, but in the bigger countries, um, uh, it, it, it tends to get 
uh, obviously more institutional and uh, and so uh, so this also explains to some ex extent uh, why uh, this kind of fully digital online government approach is is uh, available and possible uh, in the small experimental country uh, compared to like countries like uh, US, uh, Brazil, uh, Germany involved here as well. Mm -hmm. And the second question um, referring to the development of the challenges. So um, could you describe a little bit the process, how you have um, collected or evaluated um, the demands of the cities and the citizens? Yes, uh, so um, uh, what we did was that uh, we developed a very simple survey uh, to, and we sent uh, those to, uh, to all the cities um, uh, 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 of interest, uh, so altogether 35, and, uh, and, and we asked them to give um, input uh, what they mean by, uh, by future urban challenges in the field of built environment, energy, data, governments, uh, governance, uh, um, and mobility. And, uh, and then uh, we had uh, uh, online interviews uh, with uh, all the um, uh, respondents. So we received uh, 16 uh, uh, responses from the cities. Uh, and later, uh, we actually ranked and uh, and uh, and and seek for like mutual challenges, and send them back uh, for validation uh, and ranking uh, to all the 35 local governments, and then uh, we developed a list of uh, of 10 most core challenges, at least uh, uh, representing uh, the local governments of of Estonia. And now we are trying to repeat this uh, in other um, areas, uh, both in Europe and globally as well. Uh, but uh, but uh, why this is unique is that uh, that uh, that we have seen that uh, that uh, that everybody is focusing on the global challenges, uh, global urban challenges, and and uh, and this mission-driven approach to innovation and also of um, uh, UN uh, um, uh, uh, global um, uh, challenges uh, for development uh, are also very well. Uh, Understood and uh, and and uh, and and taken up uh, from the research and city uh, communities, so with SDGs. Uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, um, uh, uh, and, and there are also like the Pan-European level mapping of of uh, of uh, and and uh, and regional mapping of uh, of urban challenges, but they haven't uh, come across. Uh, a similar approach uh, 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 that, uh, that tries to ask this directly from cities uh, one to one and then come to some kind of mutual understanding uh, what are the, like, the core challenges. And this is the process uh, what we are doing now every year. So we're repeating it uh, next year as well, just to be more updated, uh, to understand what are the actual challenges. And uh, our question is that why we didn't ask it from, uh, from the cities. And so crowdsourcing is also very common. Uh, then uh, the main argument there was that uh, that we want to get uh, more um, ideas uh, uh, for like open uh, open audience, and we did the full crowdsourcing for for getting uh, ideas uh, to tackle those challenges. Uh, um, uh, but our first approach was still uh, still to uh, focus on the on the cities uh, because they have more. Uh, like let's say visionary and and, and structural understanding of, of actual challenges, but I'm very happy to share more details on on this as well. Uh, we are actually developing uh, one uh, one paper on this uh, 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 in in a month from now, uh, 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 describing in depth how we have uh, uh, opened up. Uh, this process, uh, because in in in, in a way, uh, uh, what this means is that uh, that uh, that we have uh, we are investing uh, 50 million euros ourselves into research and development. And now we have we have decided that we want to open up this process. First of all, we want to involve cities and understand their actual challenges, and then we want to open up the process to everybody to offer ideas. And this doesn't mean that we ourselves that we don't have enough ideas or that we ourselves that we wouldn't like to use this resource but uh, but uh, 
we have intuition that, uh, that in this case uh, we are getting more closer to understand uh, what cities are actually facing uh, uh, and, and, and what kind of issues they, they, they see coming uh, in, in the coming five to ten years. And on the other hand, we can involve more effectively uh, citizens, companies, uh, researchers uh, to, to offering and suggesting uh, the potential solutions as well and uh, and and uh, and and some of them can actually even join the team and uh, and come and uh, and, uh, and contact those uh, those uh, those uh, pilots as well thank you very much we can discuss this also a little bit later i would like now to come uh, come to our next speaker dietmar offenhuber um, he has received his phd at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Urban Planning and is currently Associate Professor at Northeastern University, also faculty member at Harvard and visiting professor at Princeton University. And he is also author of these fantastic books like Waste is Innovation or Decoding the City. And to be honest, he has also uh, an inspiring partner um, for developing this evening. So Dietmar, we are quite curious about your impulse. I think you are muted at the moment, so maybe you can start your microphone. I'm sorry about that. No problem. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm honored to be with you. Uh, I'm very sad that I can't be in Berlin uh, only uh, through my Zoom background, but it's great to be with uh, such great international colleagues. Uh, the Tallinn project was uh, really interesting, and I'm looking forward to the following uh, um, presentation as well. So uh, this year, I think, has been revealing in so many different ways. Uh, the pandemic has shown us a different side of big data infrastructures, among many other things. Uh, so just as a small anecdote, you would think that the case numbers in the US that are processed through so many different big data infrastructures would tell you how many people are sick or at least how many people are tested positive any given day. But in fact, at several instances, this had more to do with the capacity of fax machines that were used to transmit data. So uh, it's it's a good reminder that if you look close enough at technology, nothing is virtual. Every every data set is, is a material entity uh, that is connected to the world and activities of people in so many different ways. And I think this has a lot to do with the past 10 years of the concept of the smart city. And uh, yeah, completely agree with uh, Ralph Martin that, you know, there's a confusion often about what that means. And, you know, with every year, uh, it, it becomes less clear. And uh, I'm only talking about the last 10 years because, of course, the history is much, much older. So smart city means many things to many people. There are many misunderstandings. So I want to take a step back and look at the cultural dimension and the discursive context uh, of urban technologies. Um, and I think one important difference is that smart city means different things, tends to mean different things in Europe and in the US. And I'm mostly based in the US, so there are often confusions when I speak in Europe. Uh, and again, something else in places such as South Asia, for example. Um, and the meaning has evolved and changed over time. Um, as uh, Ute Weiland already said, in Europe, the concept is uh, a very holistic one. It's sh shaped by EU policy, a uh, broader agenda of regional development that includes just such thing as education, innovation policy, uh, and not so in the US. Uh, in the US, the first wave, uh, that's an unfortunate way, uh, first generation of smart city projects uh, were all about urban infrastructure, traffic, health, energy, municipal services, um, 
efficiency and integration. And this had a very particular historical background. After the real estate crash of 2009, IT companies such as IBM made their pitch to rebuild cities uh, with federal stimulus funds. And uh, this is a slide from IBM's Smarter Planet Initiative, uh, which was uh, one of the most uh, active ones. And I think they already started in 2009. Um, but this did not really work out as intended. Uh, so the sti stimulus money did not come because of gridlock in Congress that is uh, still with us today. And furthermore, city administrations turned out to be quite complicated and, and not very attractive customers for IT companies. Uh, you know, there's a lot of hardware to maintain, there's very little money, and uh, there's a very complicated organizations and bureaucracies. So after only three years, IBM, uh, they did not stop the project, but they put it on, on the back burner and shifted their attention to data analytics and AI and things where you don't need to deal with um, public works departments. And uh, these developments prompted me to, to publish an article, The Smart City is Dead in 2015, and you know, another example of famous last words. Uh, but I think there were many things that uh, made these very first generation of smart city concepts a little bit controversial. controversial. Uh, there was a heavy pushback from urban planners and people in urban affairs who who criticized that it was too technocratic, not people-centric enough. Uh, and you know, in these early brochures, uh, people didn't really make a big appearance. Uh, and uh, critics such as Adam Greenfield uh, published this polemic uh, against the smart city where he lists all these arguments, what is wrong with this concept of smart city is, you know, it's like too generic and has very little to do with, with real cities. Um, so, so um, he had, of course, uh, his, his points, uh, he had some really good points. Uh, of course, living in the US uh, and knowing the state of infrastructure, urban infrastructure in the US, uh, I think you know, a little bit of efficiency is, is maybe not such a bad thing. So um, I think this uh, polemic is, of course, also a reaction to the way how uh, those solutions were discussed at the time. So this led, but this concept of the smart city did not disappear as I anticipated, but the name got adapted strategically or, or opportunistically for other things. And the second generation was picked up by cities themselves. So uh, if the first generation was about technology and infrastructure, the second generation was more about design and participation. Uh, lots of prototyping, hackathons, participatory budgeting, and so on. Uh, this is a slide from the Boston Office of Urban Mechanics, uh, very early uh, pioneers in this area, um, who, who did a lot of really interesting things. So the idea here is that cities realized that urban technology is not rocket science. The technology is actually pretty basic, uh, and a lot can be done with very simple means. And instead of hiring expensive consultants, you can work with undergrad entrepreneurs who build apps and you know, the success of Code for America program, which was connecting these young techies with city administrations that had this kind of fellowship program was also uh, adapted in Germany very successfully. So uh, a lot of uh, things happened in that space. But the cities also realized that they already have all the data that they would want, and uh, they have actually the domain knowledge to interpret them. Uh, and the citizen feedback data is a very good example. Here, uh, a map that I made in, in 2012, uh, millions of millions of complaints uh, to the city of New York, uh, just three picked out here, noise, litter, and graffiti. Um, they paint a very rich picture of the city and, and you see their noise complaints are concentrated litter and, and, and graffiti and so on. But uh, one thing that we have to remember here is that urban administrative data sets is 
it, it's not pure scientific data, not at all. It's very messy, uh, very impure data. And as a result, it captures a lot of things that it was not supposed to measure. Um, so for example, this map, you know, might tell us something about where New York is noisy, but it also tells us something about where people are most likely to complain about noise to the city. So a lot of things are, are um, meshed together, which is of course, from a scientific perspective, not very ideal. But uh, if, you're, if you have these kind of really large data sets, you can pick it apart and you can use it as a proxy for many, many different things. And, and these kind of 311 data sources were used for a lot of different things. Um, this second generation was also very startup friendly. So sought collaborations with Uber and platform companies who uh, unlike IBM earlier did not ask for permission. They, they rushed into cities taking advantage of, of public goods and public infrastructure. And uh, this of course, as we all know, uh, also created a lot of problems. And um, yeah, I forgot to mention. So I, one interesting design aspect uh, of these um, citizen feedback mechanisms is that um, it, it also shows you how uh, data definitions are negotiated between cities and, and citizens. Uh, New York started off by um, describing or um, publishing 150 categories of urban problems and but of course citizens have a very different understanding of what is a problem and how to describe it and and through this kind of iterative uh, interaction uh, they narrowed it down to to 20 uh, categories and and i found this uh, i looked into this evolution of, of how these apps changed because again you know these citizen complaint apps these 311 systems as they're called in the us are in a way very trivial, very simple, very modest things, but uh, they actually played a huge role. Uh, it was a very low level participation that was nevertheless able to engage a lot of people. So uh, getting back at platform companies and uh, well, let's, let's call it the more oppressive aspects of big tech that became more and more visible uh, the third generation of uh, urban technology um, efforts tend to be explicitly political while you know, first with the infrastructure design. Here is really in the foreground, power relationships, uh, structural inequalities, racial biases. The example here, the Algorithmic Justice League, uh, which looks at uh, many things, including uh, kind of racial biases resulting from facial recognition uh, technology. Background is, for example, the, the, you know, the misuse of facial recognition technology in US police departments, along with license plate scanners. Uh, Clearview is a startup company that harvests uh, profile pictures from Facebook uh, and, and sells it to police departments. Uh, what played a role in identifying protesters in, in Black, Life, Black Lives Matter move uh, protests. So uh, there, there, there's a lot that there are a lot of really nasty issues that that have come up in the last years, and of course these are bigger societal issues. But uh, what I want to emphasize here is that again, it's the cities who who play a very important role here, and and often uh, the same groups and. Uh, people who, who already worked in the, in the second generation and in, in these earlier uh, um, initiatives. Um, and, but I think this is also where the US has learned from European cities and to more decidedly assert their authority to regulate. Uh, example is the regulation of, of Uber and gig economy uh, companies in, in California and moratoriums of facial recognition, San Francisco, many other cities. And uh, yeah, I think uh, this, this, is, this is, I guess, where we are at the moment. Um, I want to conclude with one last perspective uh, because I also worked a lot in, uh, for UNTP and, and other groups in Eastern Europe, South America, Southeast Asia. 
where the smart city again means something very different. Uh, there is there is often this critique of smart city solutions made for Western cities, then sold to the global south, regardless of whether tech fits the local context. But I think uh, on the other on the other hand, we also can learn a lot from how these cities uh, in Indonesia, in in the Philippines, uh, in uh, in Brazil approach uh, technology. And uh, I, for example, I worked in Indonesia a couple of years ago. Uh, this is the city of Surabaya who built an impressive uh, smart city project from scratch. Of course, it also includes an urban operation center. And uh, so it was all made together with a local university. Uh, and, and, and we looked at uh, the way how those projects come together. My colleague, Katja Schechner, who is now at the OECD, uh, and I, we published this paper where we talked about this as uh, infrastructure, uh, improvisational in infrastructure governance, where a, a network of actors who don't have exactly the same information um, work together almost like a jazz uh, group uh, and there's a lot of call and response and, and reactions to, to policy initiatives. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that they all have the same goal and, and there's, a, there's a lot of conflict, uh, but I, I think uh, what, what is really interesting here is also understanding uh, working with urban technology is uh, uh, has a lot to do with continuous maintenance with uh, you know constant debugging uh, maintenance and repair so it's there is no uh, you know project is not finished once you deploy these uh, sensors at some point you have to recharge the batteries or do something else with it so uh, I, th I think what I want to conclude with is that uh, not thinking about technology as the solution but but often it's a it's an ongoing activity. Uh, it's uh, the activity of, of bricolage, of appropriation, of probing, sometimes revealing a problem, prototyping. And I don't want to kind of put this into a romantic context. It involves, may involve a lot of conflict, a lot of uh, power differentials and, and oppression. But I think it's important to think about that uh, as an activity and, you know, as uh, in uh, in the open source community, uh, you know, every software is, is constantly uh, a beta version. There's never a final uh, version. And, uh, and to look at technologies from this kind of uh, procedural improvisational perspective uh, is, is something that I think uh, also helps us in, uh, in, in Europe and in, in US cities. Um, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dietmar. Um, also, um, two short uh, questions. One very concrete, referring to the concept of infrastructures, um, just to get it uh, in the right sense. Uh, is it more a platform where citizens communicate on cases where things don't work well and which they have to repair, or is it on a techno technological basis, so to work with the technology mm. to improve the things? You know, it's interesting the word platform. Uh, when uh, when plat, plat, the term platform company first showed up in literature, it, it was in the context of Olivetti in the 70s, and, and platform here was not understood as a technical platform, but as an informal arrangement between people who, who have a very strong relationship, but who are ready to constantly reconfigure and change the shape of the company and, and turn it into something else. And, and I think this is the way how I understand here platform, uh, that it's, it's more about the uh, informal relationships between people. Uh, I can give an example in, in, uh, in the Philippines where I worked with, with Katja Schechtner, um, you know, the, um, it's, it's, it's a very tricky situation about how things like street lighting and uh, electricity is, um, how this is regulated and distributed on the one hand, aggressively privatized. On the other hand, there are uh, all these barriers where local administrations don't have a lot of 
voice in this process. And we looked at the way how these kind of street level bureaucrats and, and people um, who who run neighborhoods uh, improvise together with the electricity company, together with local um, uh, crafts persons to, uh, to provide uh, electricity to provide street lighting. So it's, it's, it's very much this process of uh, improvisational production of, of technology, but the technology doesn't have, never really has a final form. It's, it's always like constant, continuously shifting. Mm -hmm. But that would, so this is how, how I would. But that would mean also that uh, it, it is imaginable that um, if people um, have the competences to work with the data by themselves, they could also yeah, do this kind of improvised and network-based repair services and mm -hmm. so on, um, also on a higher level, so on a technological higher level, or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, it's... It's, it's interesting to look at the difference between, for example, how local governance in, in the U.S. versus uh, Europe works. In in U.S., cities are very, um, you know, uh, 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 very weak. They don't have a lot of resources, uh, and therefore the process is much more participatory because there are a lot of... Uh, um, civil society organizations who are very deeply involved uh, in, in, in this local governance. Uh, whereas in, in, in Europe, cities are in a, on a much stronger footing and very often these kind of participatory initiatives are sometimes perceived as by decree from above because, you know, the city has everything sorted out and they know what they want and so they kind of this this participation is is, is not uh something that comes out of necessity to solve a problem but uh, it's 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 a kind of a, it, it's it's something slightly different so i think the word participation is, is usually very misleading because uh, we really have to look at uh, what kind of things we are um we are, we are talking about uh and It can be very tokenistic or it can be uh, empowering, but you know, there are many different ways uh, how to talk about that. I don't want to endorse this idea where the citizens are responsible for uh, running the city. Uh, there's also this, what, what in literature is sometimes called the tyranny of, of participation, where it's, it's uh, also something, a burden that is placed often on uh, Uh, marginalized groups uh, in the city. Uh, but on the other hand, there are also many, many examples where even like a small uh, um, act can improve many things, you know, where uh, you know, with the examples of, of these 311 apps where, um, you know, uh, um, the The, the, the benefits were in a way much much bigger than than what was initially anticipated. So, yeah, I mean, I think I'm I'm all for uh, this uh, co-production and uh, you know any, any kind of commons based uh, approaches. And uh, it's 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 just always very complicated, and it's it, you have to look very closely how how these conditions uh, look like. So for example, negative example would be around, you know, during the London Olympics, uh, the, the concept of the big society. I don't know if this is still uh, something that is familiar, uh, where this participation, participatory approach to governance was heavily promoted uh, by the government, but at the same time funds were withdrawn from um, from from social programs and so on. So in a way, it, it was seen or promoted almost as a replacement of uh, social programs. And uh, so one has to look very carefully because participation is very easy to to put uh, into a, you know use friend friendly terms to to hide something uh, that is uh, you know not 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 necessarily empowering. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you very much. I would like now to come to my uh, to our third speaker, and Lenora da Silva Schweitzer is located in Brazil, and she has a vast experience in law, in particular with open data and privacy policies, and also in management and public policies. 
She has been professor at the Information Science Department at Federal University of Pariba and was member of several commissions and committees like the National Council of Justice. So, Leonora, Leonora, we are looking forward to your impulse, but Dietmar, I think you have to leave the floor now. <laughs> Ah, okay. Lenora, you have to say something to put on your microphone. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here talking about uh, access to information and data privacy in Brazil. I have to admit it's a huge challenge to try and understand about fundamental rights in a Latin American country of continental proportions. But I'll try to provides a quick oversight overview of the subject. As you know, after more than 25 years of authoritarianism, the political basis for democracy and liberal premises of universal citizenship rights was finally reestablished in Brazil in 1988. Okay. Thus, Nora? the constitutional... Yes? Um, could you come a little bit closer to your microphone, please? Because uh, we, we don't hear you very well at the moment. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. Uh, so, after better. more, as I said, is it better? Yes, thank you. Oh, so as I said, after more than 25 years of authoritarianism, uh, we are facing a democracy and the constitution of 1988 bring several uh, fundamental rights as well as mediated rights of a patient. And in 1991, the law on archives provides for open access to files held by the state's archives, documents relating to national security, international relations and defense are sealed for 50 years and documents con that contain personal information are still for 70 years. And the development of uh, information society in, in Brazil was the subject of the efforts of the Ministry of Science and Technology in 1999 and to 2000. And this was registered in a report known as Libro Verde, Green Book, this Green Book of 2000 with a lot of EgoGov initiatives. And the major boost to e-development in Brazil came from the judiciary. Uh, for so far, the establish of a very sophisticated system of full electronic votes in 2000, and it's still now our electronic vote process. And four years later, Brazilian federal justice has begun the movement towards a paperless society and a full electronic judicial processing. And in 2009, Brazilian law and transparency emphasized the information technologies and communications, in particular the internet, encouraging and requiring public organizations to make the information on the World Wide Web. Uh, the 2011 law on access to information considers the observance of publicity as a general process and secrecy as an exception. It was a huge advance in Brazil. Also in 2011, Brazil joined the Open Government Partnerships and signed the Open Government Declaration. And also, the 2016 decree 8777 established the open data policy of the federal executive government and Brazilian government institutions provide official data sets of federal, states, and municipal levels to support transparency through e-government. And finally, uh, President Temer signed the private and data protection bill into law two years ago, and LGPD 
is in effect since last September. Brazil said GPD mirrors the Europe GDPR in many ways. And like the GDPR, the LGPD applies to a wide range of data processing. Besides, the LGPD defines personal data broadly and includes a similar file structure as the GDPR for non-compliance. I don't know if it's well known, but Brazil has a population for more than 200 million, of which 85% live in the cities. Most of the population is concentrated in metropolitan areas of state capitals, mega cities such as São Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and Salvador. In the last 50 years, the economy has changed quickly from agricultural to industrial and to service-based. The service sector now accounts for two-thirds of the country's GDP and is still growing in proportion to agriculture and industry. However, global information technology reports 2016 shows, as you see, Brazil is ranked the second step, seventh second place, and the business and innovation environment is ranked as one of the weakest in the world. But in terms of make government data open, Brazil stands out as a top performer and is ranked eighth in the global open data index. In general, Brazil faces more problems of usability than of process. The frequency of problems is greatest, as you can see, in yellow quality, locations, claims, ownerships, weather forecasts, and company register. The most common problems of the databases is their poor usability uh, or difficult in working with them, followed by the non-availability of a download option of the entire database. Besides, some problems are particularly critical when observed frequently precisely because they are essential aspects of the transparency. The non-existence of information and the existence of restriction on access to it. As Professor Offerhuber explained, the concept of smart cities is still without a clear definition. In Brazil, although we can find a lot of different ones, uh, the main concept of smart cities is linked to a way to solve, solve or at least diminish the challenge of how to grant access to basic infrastructure facilities. And since 2014 initiatives in Curitiba towards smart living has, have received more than 21 awards and the city is a top performer in smart cities rankings. Despite having one of the most sophisticated banking system in the world, Brazil still has millions of citizens technologically excluded, with crumbling servers in thousands of municipalities. Mobile internet, uh, smartphones have become a viable alternative to traditional fixed line and line connections, and social media is highly popular. WhatsApp is the top social media messenger app in the country. As of January 2019, Brazil was the third leading country Facebook users and is the 50th, 50th country with the highest number of internet users. Brazil is also the world leader in internet fraud. And at least 75% of Brazilian internet users claim to have been victims of some form of cybercrime. Nevertheless, Brazil is ranked number seven against other places in the global cybersecurity index. Those numbers 
make clear that security is not one of the biggest concerns of the Brazilian information society. It's also common knowledge that even against the law, data sets are still being sold by street hawkers on Santa Virginia Road in São Paulo. Three weeks ago, the Brazilian Supreme Court of Justice, FPG, Jay, was hit by a major ransomware attack, and its service, including the official website, was forced to go offline for a, for a whole week. Ten days ago, hackers tried to take Brazilian's electoral system off the air during election day. Here, you can find the, the ransom notes and, and, and the cybercrime team uh, noticing the, the invasion. Well, with those facts, I want to emphasize that despite the similarities between GDPR and LGPD, each norm has a different background. Why GDPR is the result of human rights awareness raising activities that began in the early 70s. The Brazilian law on privacy and data protection is inspired by GDPR, but Brazilians still have a low level of knowledge about fundamental individual rights. During the early age of privacy in Europe, back 1970s, Brazilian society was faced a military dictatorship. The enactment of Brazil's LGBT, of course, is a huge advance towards human rights protection in the country. But we didn't get there. We'll get there eventually. What I need to be clear is that 2020 it's just the dawn of privacy and data protection in Brazil. That's mainly what I want to tell in, in a short time about uh, information security and data protection in Brazil. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this interesting insight into the current situation in Brazil. Um, from a European perspective, we are always um, impressed, <laughs> at least by the numbers. It's really incredible. I think the technological future will be decided somewhere else in the world. So, But maybe also two or three questions. First of all, um, maybe a very personal question. Um, where do you see more, how to say... Um, opportunities um, referring to the technological development in Brazil in the potential of transparency and a legal framework or in the threats um, connected with uh, cyber crime and uh, also th uh, terrorism um, coming from other countries? Well, I believe that we have to face our problems and I'm an optimist, I'm an optimist, and I believe, I really believe that we're gonna make through all, all the challenges that we are now facing. So we are going to, to uh, survive these problems. Mm -hmm. And um, referring to the legal frameworks, um, you have stressed also that, of course, um, every law has its more or less national um, foundation and also limits, but we are talking about global developments, global uh, connections, global flows of um, data. Um, do you think there is a perspective for something like global standards, also referring to transparency and security? We have to get there also, the whole world, but it, it's territorially, it's really difficult because it, you have to deal with uh, different culture, different uh, kind of law, and, and the government wants uh, change in, in a short term. I don't believe that we're going to have a huge change. 
But in terms of Brazil, what I believe is that uh, uh, the federal police is really concerned about uh, the threats and things like this. But we, we have not the, the culture for, for security. We are, we are still learning about security. Mm -hmm. We are more, more fond of uh, uh, new forms of, of, of uh, uh, social interaction than with security. Is the way that we do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would like to bring together now um, all three of you um, onto the floor, and maybe we can try um, something like a common discussion, even if the technical uh, limitations are always a little bit strict. And I would like to give, um, yeah, Dietmar and uh, Ralf Martin also the chance chance to react. Um, on the other uh, contributions, uh, particular of um, Lenora at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I have a question uh, for Lenora because um, uh, I, you know, I, I know that Brazil has has some really innovative uh, laws also in the last years, uh, but the challenge is always the the distance between. Um, enforcement of these laws uh, and uh, the conceptualization of these laws and 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 Europe is not different. I mean, you also GDPR is there are big questions of how to enforce uh, uh, violations. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on that. As I said, uh, uh, LGBT is really new here in, in, in Brazil. People are get used. Uh, two months ago, uh, the whole society thought it we would postpone the effect of LGBT. So right now, people are still thinking about what we are going to do. Uh, at the moment, I, I'm in a group trying to to build some some. Some norms for 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 the judiciary, and we are still thinking about. So that the law is already in effect, in effect, and it it was it was signed two years ago. But but we are still thinking about it. How we are gonna deal with it, and we are trying to to follow. The, the best uh, uh, standards that uh, come from Europe, but we are not close to a solution at all at the moment. It's really new. I would like um, to pose another question uh, to Ralf Martin, because you have stressed this open flow of data in your presentation very much. So um, how you are handling these questions um, of also the threats of um, terrorism or um, yeah, the, the, the demands for cybersecurity, if you have this situation that the government prom uh, promotes the open flow of data so much? Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much uh, for your presentations. Uh, I would have so many questions to both of you, but uh, but uh, I agree that uh, that um, if uh, Brazil uh, is, is is very strong in open data, as as mentioned, and New York is very strong in open data, like, uh, like coming from US side, uh, uh, then Estonia um, has been quite. Uh, weak in terms of opening up its databases, uh, but on the other hand, uh, where Estonia has been piloting and, uh, and experimental is, uh, is, uh, is uh, all kind of data integration. And, and that's a bit different story because, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and if you have this kind of um, uh, close to perfect data integration uh, between local government databases, uh, uh, when like, uh, uh, 
question about open data um, uh, comes in the second level, uh, I would say, because uh, when it's the main question is that how to make uh, data available to the public and researchers and so on, but not to, for example, uh, civil servants themselves, uh, which is the case uh, if, it's, if there is no open data collaboration uh, or no, no data exchange. And, and so Estonia actually started uh, differently, but, uh, but, uh, but like uh, three, four years ago, we were uh, pretty much uh, ranked the best in terms of e-government and, and still are in, in Europe, but in terms of open data, we were in the bottom in all kinds of uh, EU rankings and global rankings as well. Now, uh, uh, there has been significant investments and, and the government has understood that it is important, uh, uh, but still uh, it is, um, uh, I would say that, uh, that, uh, that uh, but it, it's it's very difficult to achieve both uh, goals at the same time, because, for example, if you have this system that uh, you as a citizen can have access uh, to all kind of data that the government and local government have on you, and uh, and from all kind of databases, so I can open it up uh, right now and show uh, to you as well uh, what kind of uh, data there is. Uh, uh, on my personal information, on my family, on my medical situation, on my military, uh, whatever. So everything is there. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, now the question is, that, uh, what is my motivation? Uh, uh, and, and some data is, is more public as well, let's say, but, uh, but, uh, but not everything is, is sensitive. But, uh, but if I can use this dashboard and I can check uh, the data from through uh, like strong identification, uh, because the difference between closed data and open data is that, uh, that, uh, that in the first case, you just need this uh, identification as well, whether it is uh, machine readable or not, or not, but you need to somehow prove that, uh, that you are who you are. And, and in this perspective, it is uh, like uh, like an interesting challenge uh, we are facing, and uh, and I admire a lot uh, uh, what uh, Brazil in general is doing, and uh, and uh, and and in terms of uh, also not, not in, only in terms of uh, open data, but in terms of uh, like uh, uh, participation models in general. So I, I see this uh, I'm involved in in in, in one. Uh, Joint project as well, mainly with, uh, with Porto Alegre region, uh, but uh, but uh, but uh, but I have seen that uh, this kind of uh, also like academia and, and city collaboration and and having joint workshops and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 this enthusiasm and 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 and, and approach uh, is is definitely something uh, we are learning as well uh, from uh, from our partners from Brazil. So it's uh, it's definitely. Uh, very interesting what you're doing, and uh, and the positive side there is that uh, that uh, that uh, you have a bit different uh, legal framework than in the EU. Uh, uh, in the EU, at least from a data side, uh, we are having next week a conference that uh, that uh, that, uh, that data scientists are claiming that uh, that it is already too overregulated. Uh, uh, for uh, for all kinds of database policy making and database analysis, uh, obviously, like this is very narrow view from a data scientist point of view. But uh, but the claims already there are that uh, that uh, that uh, this, uh, data access uh, regulation uh, from EU side is uh, as as developed into a very very difficult level, uh, which makes sense as well. But uh, but on the other hand. Uh, uh, to some extent, uh, you cannot ac achieve both goals at the same time. You cannot make it uh, like a full open uh, uh, data platform and at the same time uh, follow all kind of uh, GDPR rules as well uh, without hindering the access to data. Uh, but there needs to be a compromise. Uh, but uh, but uh, but uh, but uh, but it is getting quite difficult here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very sorry, but we have to, lock, uh, to look on um, the watch. Um, so maybe one last question um, to Dietmar. Um, if you like, you can stay also on the Zoom streaming um, among yourself, so you can continue the discussion. But I think we have to close the um, public part, uh, at least uh, in a few minutes. So Dietmar, maybe one last question. Um, if the smart city develops in that direction um, you have um, presented, um, what is the future role of architects and designers in this context? 
And city developers. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's always a good question. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, again, it's interesting that there's a huge difference between the US and, and Europe uh, in, in the US since the whole planning discipline is very much oriented on uh, on, on, on legal, uh, on, you know, on law and on uh, sociology rather than architecture. Uh, there, <clears throat> It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of a different role uh, in, in Europe. Of course, architects are uh, involved in, in urban planning and, 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 and design to a, to a very large extent. Um, yeah, I think to architects bring a certain type of spatial competency in understanding and decoding all these patterns that arise through this gig economy, through the platform economy and all that stuff. I mean, I'm thinking about this one particular study analyzing the Airbnb um, ownership and distribution in Berlin, where, where you, you see you know, how the whole social fabric of the city has completely uh, reorganized. So uh, maybe this is not a statement about architects as as individuals or as a group, but uh, uh, a way of saying that all of these developments have spatial consequences and they reorganize the city, uh, not just in social and not just in economic terms, but also in spatial terms. Uh, and of course, you know, if you, uh, if you, if you, um, you know, use ride sharing apps and, and you talk uh, to the drivers uh, where do they live I mean they usually don't live in the city they live in in places where they can uh, you know afford to live with this type of uh, uh, precarious um, uh, type of, 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 of labor so uh, the whole uh, social arrangement is is, is uh, heavily impacted uh, by uh, by those companies and uh, and I think, uh, those those questions need to be also addressed, uh, or these implications need, need to be also addressed in, in, in the spatial consequences. Thank you very much. Also, this discussion has to be unfinished. Many thanks to our panelists. Many thanks to our team. Um, the next Metropolen Gespräch will be held in German again. So am kommenden Donnerstag, uh, den 26. November, geht es um die Zukunft der Mobilität in Berlin unter dem Titel Hauptwege von morgen, umkämpfte Bühnen der Verkehrswende, ähm, wird über Lö Lösungsstrategien ähm, für den Konflikt zwischen Fußgängern, Radfahrern, Autofahrern, Bahnfahrern, Schienenverkehr und so weiter ähm, gesprochen. Ähm, der Platz wird bekanntlich weniger und wir brauchen dringend ähm, Perspektiven ähm, für alternative Mobilitätskonzepte. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe, stay, stay well and have a great time. Goodbye.